we have February the 19th, 2020, a fantastic year has gotten started with all kinds of global events unfolding in a very positive direction. We continue our series today with the Brilliance and Commerce House of Freedom International Natural Law Trust series. And uh, we are a project of La Verite, Liberty Debt Elimination System, affiliations and special offers with Belf Building Systems, credit repair, and a lot of other things that you may have seen on our website. We're members of the Worldwide Charter for Fair International Commerce. We invite you to look at that on our website, which has the certificate, and it upholds standards in international commerce. Today is February 19th, 2020. Our next webinar will be Wednesday, March 18th. Same time, same station, March 18th next month. And we plan to continue these every month. Good. We uh, invite you to look at our website if you haven't already and subscribe to our newsletter if you haven't already. You would just go to the website and click newsletter sign up. And for those calling in by phone, if you ever need to reach us by phone, leave a message at 360-200-7521. That's a USA number for our international friends. My name is Tonson Fairmont, member of the Board of Advisors of Monocle Management Group, speaker of radio shows and investment seminars, and author of a few books, and chief cook and bottle washer. So <laughs> <clears throat> we have the great privilege, Dominique and I have been observing that our good friend Randall has brought together wisdom from various mentors over several decades, spanning uh, back about 50 years, uh, if you include the experience of the teachers, who have gathered the wisdom of the trust crafting process that has been used by the Kennedys, by the Mellons, the Carnegies, the Rockefellers, many of the wealthy families of the world. And we are able to enjoy today at the middle class level the same asset protection secrets that the super rich have used. And we've taken it one step higher than the common law trust, and we've called it natural law because natural law is really the law of the universe. And we try to emulate that in common law. So the common law trust best implemented is really ethical, integral, in support of nature, in support of life, and does not cause harm or violation of anyone's rights. And therefore, we call it natural law. And it's international because it's not subject to the jurisdiction of any particular locality. Rather, it's subject to an international written code of ethics and procedures to maintain proper uh, compliance with Ex respect, respect of others' property, respect of each other's rights. Randall Hilner is our head of the department at Brilliance and Commerce and is the uh, creator of the House of Freedom Trust, White Light Unlimited, One People's Public Trust, and our International Natural Law Trust, which has been enjoyed by several thousand people over the many years we've been doing this. We're joined today also by Dominique. Uh, Hackett, and she is of Santa Barbara, California, is 54 years young, has five children, past CFO of two construction companies, a C corporation and S corporation that she helped incorporate. She's done cost accounting for construction projects as large as $34 million, runs her own California limited liability company that includes trustee services. She has installed double entry accounting systems, and she's currently on the board of two statutory 501 three C nonprofit corporations, one of which she helped to get started. Likewise, she is co-trustee of a natural law trust purchased from Brilliance and Commerce. She provides professional trustee services. She's a California public notary and operates both Apple Mac and Windows PCs. She's also a weekly radio co-host on Teen Sports Radio. And you can see her testimonial at our testimonials page at BIC website. Today's webinar, uh, we're gonna have both Dominique and Randall sharing the uh, presentation. And our topic today is secrets of superior asset protection. So I'll go right into the first slide. 
Uh, what is asset protection? Very good. Do you want to begin, Randall? Can you see oh, the screen? Okay. I knew somebody was going to ask that, but yeah, <laughs> let's start there. Um, what, what is asset protection? What does it really mean? We, we had talked about that earlier, and it's really a unique process because we're talking about being able to take assets that normally you would have to carry in your pocket. And with our the trust work that we do and the way we put it all together and write it for you um, allows that asset to reside in it. It's like its own safe deposit box. And as long as the trustees that are chosen are well thought about, they're either friends or uh, Dominique has been gracious in being willing to be a co-trustee and I don't think you get any anybody better than her to help you do that and um, I've got so many things going on that I what I would do my job is to coach help coach Dominique so that she can do her job and then uh, I can make sure that the clients, uh, mostly I write up all the trust documents and that allows me the time to do that and um, only have to uh, participate when it's needed. And um, I've been, been doing this for so long that when I sit down with a client, it's like creating a relationship and just carrying on and making it simple. Um, the trust complex, the trust is a complex, irrevocable complex trust. Uh, we can call it a natural law trust or a common law trust, whatever, but it's non-statutory because it's a contract between three of us. Let's say for now, uh, me and Tanzan and Dominique, we want to create a, a trust and put an asset in it. It doesn't matter what it is. Sometimes the asset is going to be uh, very movable or sometimes going to be very, very static. But the idea is that it's protected no matter what. So um, however we want to expand on asset protection, um, I mean, that's all I can, I don't know how else to expand on that other than the fact that you've taken your asset that's really valuable in your life, whether it's for your family, for yourself, your extended family, et cetera, or for maybe some uh, um, charities that you want to give it to, is that it's safe and it's on its own. It's, it's, uh, I say it's like taking it out of your pocket and putting it into the hands of two. And again, you have to go back to a trusteeship and being a trustee has basically, uh, it's a legal fiduciary responsibility for you if you decide to be a trustee to really step up to the plate and understand that it's your responsibility to make sure that that asset is protected for whoever it's going to go to into the future. Want to add anything, Dominique? I love it. I um, we were doing a trustee study class, study group together, and we were reading about how it, uh, there's a lot of things on the internet that say asset protection, but it, it's really about how Randall, you help people structure their trust, making sure who is it, who's the grantor, the trustees, right. and the beneficiaries, and then also the language. I mean, you've put together this beautiful trust indenture that's in, uh, Townsend calls it high school English. So the structure and the language is part of the process, but also, the substance of the transaction. So I really appreciate 
being able to work with you because if I have a question about something, I can shoot you a quick email and, uh, and that helps because asset protection isn't an, an instant, oh, magic wand. <laughs> no. It requires the trustee to properly drive the vehicle of the trust. Exactly. Yeah. You're in charge, especially if you're the trustee. And that's um, one of the reasons uh, that I always encourage two trustees, uh, either two co-trustees or two, uh, one trustee with a successor trustee. In fact, now the banks are requiring, um, I think it's very difficult to open up a bank account with only one trustee, but that's good because you need somebody the banks don't want to be pick up having to pick up and be a trustee when it should already be in place so that if something happens to the first trustee, the other one can step in and they already know what the asset base is. They already know how to play it. The, you know, you, as you co-trustee with somebody else, you, need to learn what's what's in there and you have to keep it private obviously and but you are ready to pick up the ball and make sure that there's um uh even a third person ready to go to be the next successor trustee etc and um it's a revolving process it's as you know, in corporations or uh, anything else, it's it's always a, a consortium in a way. It's a consortium, but it's a lot more free because it's not ruled by the government. It's not a government entity, so it's not ruled by the the process of any government issuance. I mean, you can write a statutory trust written by a lawyer and and then you're in the system. So, but if you do a natural law trust or uh, the trust that we write is that it's between, it's a contract between three people and those three people are bonding themselves together to protect those assets. It's Beautiful. really... It's really a sweet deal. And I think we talked about this earlier. It's really important. We talked about a paper trail, remember? Huge. Every time that there is something happening, every action or um, process that goes on, it's really important that it's recorded and um, and written down so there's a trail and there's never a space in there where something's missing to so that they can't question oh well you didn't do this and so who, you know who's got the money or who, where'd the money go or what happened you know what happened to this and when you do that and you have a paper trail and that's kept really clean that's so why i say you know get a three ring binder a big five inch three ring binder and just put lots get ready to put lots of paper in it because over the years it's going to become a pretty rather a pretty big book and it's going to it's going to show the history of this trust engine going forever that's why Donson you mentioned earlier about the Rockefellers and the Kennedys I mean they're all statutory but we we don't care about that but the fact is that everything is all tied together it's all recorded and it's all available so there's no question that um something wasn't done right my understanding is that they they use they use the statutory for their public uh interface but they use the non-statutory privately oh i wouldn't doubt it at all i mean i don't know how they operate on you, you that's why you don't know how they operate because it is kept private on that level. And that's why I, you can call 
the trust however you want it. But for me, it's a private, irrevocable trust. And that's all it needs to be named. And it belongs to whoever creates the contract, the, the, the grantor and the two trustees, co-trustees, and then the beneficiaries. Beautiful. <laughs> okay. So next slide. I'm not seeing any slides, so you're going to have to say if you see a slide, you got to read it to me. You got it. Dominique, did you uh, want to cover your points one and two there? Sure. So uh, we did talk about the structure. Structure means who the grantor is, who the co-trustees are, and then how you're setting up the beneficiaries and who the beneficiaries are. And that you work out with Randall. And the language of the trust, that is that the beautiful trust indenture. That's, that's basically what Randall has put together for us. That is so beautifully written. And the second, the substance of a transaction is related to how you're putting a particular asset into your trust. And what are the particulars of that exchange of that asset into the trust? Right. So my understanding, the structure, reading your trust indenture, very important. Every one of us must read and reread our trust indenture. And then understanding how we exchange assets into our trust this is how we achieve asset protection. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Okay, you ready for the next one? Sure. Okay. So our, our slide is, uh, how is it possible that we're wearing too many hats? We'll start with that one. Well... Let's see, if you like the Red Sox, you'll probably have a red hat. If you like the Yankees, it'll be black and white. But <laughs> uh, too many hats, that's, uh, that's a critical part of this process as well. Um, two out of three, you, you can choose to do two out of three. Um, First is the grantor. Um, in the early days, when we first started this, um, back in the early 70s, I guess, I guess that kind of dates my, <laughs> <laughs> dates me to some extent. Um, uh, you, you, you have, you're usually the grantor, chose two trustees. We, there was no real trustee service, although uh, we did offer, when we first got together with my partner in, um, in Marin in California, um, we would often, if somebody was really uh, uh, old, elderly or older, more incapacitated, then we would step in and we would offer uh, trustee service and so we would kind of take over their their financial system and because they needed it they couldn't do it themselves and we were held accountable and um, in the early days in those days it was really simple we, one or two trustees could walk into the bank we would have the the trust book and we would say, need to open up an account, please. Um, these are the people involved. Uh, we have a notar we have a notarized signature. They couldn't get out of the house, so we've taken a notary to them so that they these signatures are, are theirs. Picture of them, whoever they are, and then we would take it into the bank, and the banks would say, okay, fine. Here's here's the book and. At that time, there weren't any credit cards. It was no card. It was just a checkbook or, or cash. Um, I remember those days. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> it just got more and more difficult. And then 9-11 happened, and it got really wacky. So let's go back to now where the banks have 
kind of stepped in and made it a little bit more difficult. And now uh, what I'm finding um, is that usually the bank wants a signature of both the trustees. And um, so you, and you can do it. Oh, I had to coordinate one where one trustee was on the West Coast, one trustee was on the East Coast. The only way the bank would allow the signature cards to be signed was the West Coast gentleman had to be at the bank uh, at nine o'clock and the East Coast gentleman had to be at the bank at three o'clock and they had to go to the same you know, the office and they set up a phone call where both people signed in front of the bank officer and it was okay. It was, it happened, but it, it's just the banking system. And I, that's a conversation that I don't really want to get into at this point <laughs> in time. Um, but it's getting more and more difficult uh, just because the rules of banking have gotten more stringent and the bank is more, more more control and um i mean they should have less control you know it, whose money is it whose asset is it it's yours they should be actually you know looking for your business oh how can we help you how, how can we make it easier for you to do banking business with us and that's what we want to do and um Depending on your relationship with a bank, sometimes it's easy. I have uh, clients that um, they've had a same banker for 20 years and they walk into the bank and um, they have their trust paperwork. And sometimes the bank will let them be the, the signer at the moment. And then they say, well, okay, if the other co-trustee can't come in right now, then he needs to come in and see Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones. And um, as long as he has the paper that you sign and the notarization, then it's done. So there's ways to get around it and, and, and set it up so that you can have a banking relationship. I know Tonson been fortunate to have some really good relationship with the bankers. And some people struggle with it, but we, as we say, Tanzan would say, you know, you just got to walk across the street and go to the next bank until they say, sure, we'd love your business. You know, and at some point, the bank, you'll find a bank that would say, would be very happy to help you do your business. And all of a sudden it's running. And now, now you have a new relationship. You probably have a personal a banking account with them, but you'll also have the new trust account with them. And that's another subject that we'll get into later, but for right now, it's how we're doing. So we're gonna have, we're talking about hats. So you have the, the grantor and the trustees, co-trustees. I mean, it's wonderful to have Dominique as a co-trustee because she's so adept at it. And um, she, but she's separate from the whole thing, so she's professional, but she's right there for you, and she can help you with any issue. And if she needs anything more, she can always get a hold of me. And sometimes I call the banker and just chat, and it, in five minutes, it's taken care of. And sometimes again it's like okay let's find another bank but typically um there's always a bank that's would like to have your business so on the uh, the wearing of the too many hats i um i think what i've learned from you is that it's in order to create a strong trust so that no one can view the trust as your alter ego is that that basically it yep that's the major that's the very basis of it and it keeps um it's the separation that you need you need to keep separate your assets in other words if you have control of your assets that's why right, right in the beginning of, of the trust document one of the first paragraphs is that the settler 
can have no prearrangements with the trustees that, you know, they can make up a list and say, okay, I want you to be the trustees, but I want, I want to hold the book and I want to be able to do this and this and this. And that's what gets everybody in trouble uh, with their trust because they're still in control and they have, you've got to give up control. I mean, with that, I mean, it's, that's so critical. But when you do, when you find the trustees that you really trust and, and, uh, and you know they're going to stand there for you and protect that asset base, then you're fine. Uh, and you can also be, let's see, so uh, you could be settler. Uh, if you're going to be a settler and a beneficiary, then I would say don't be a trustee. Don't be a co-trustee. If you want to be a co-trustee, then don't be uh, a beneficiary. But there are ways to work around all of it. And some the best ways is to have nominee grantor. Okay, so not... Uh, Dominique is gracious enough to offer a nominee grant, grant or service. So that's one hat that nobody has to worry about. So if you're not involved with that, if you're not the grantor and you're either just a trustee or a beneficiary, then there is enough separation there that um, it keeps it from being anything too close. And of course, if you have uh, if you have a number of beneficiaries, you have two co-trustees and a number of beneficiaries, then you have a lot of separation and you're, you're, you'll be fine. So that's the primary reason for structuring it with only wearing two hats at the most. So there's, there's your hats. <laughs> now, what color hats you want to wear is totally up to you. And if there's confusion, if any of you have confusion about that, if you're listening and you have confusion about that, there's, uh, don't hesitate to either um, email me or call me. If we're if if you're a client, then you'll have um, access to me anyway. And you have a wonderful webinar that you already did where you discussed the roles of the, of the three hats, which was fabulous. <laughs> yes, I remember that. That was, I was pretty, uh, I was pretty lit up that afternoon. <laughs> which reminds me, everyone. Um, so you can always go to brilliance-videos.com and you'll see our YouTube channel and all of our past webinars there on YouTube for review of a lot of the knowledge that Randall's already given out before. I would, take it, well, I would definitely take advantage of that. And now that I've talked to Dominique and, and what she's doing with uh, passing the buck, um, I think that's another critical thing uh, to check it out as well, because um, passing a buck is, is very different approach to um to what i do what uh, i think dominique are gonna do together we're gonna go in a different direction and um it's just it's going to be just as vital but it'll be it'll have a different flavor to it and everyone who is typing questions into the chat we just uh, to remind you we'll be entertaining those when we open it up to q a so we will save go ahead and write them down if you wish anytime yeah. we will save them for the question and answer part of the program good yeah i like i like uh, seeing these questions coming up because kind of um makes my brain rattle a little bit and so then i start to think about how um how i can put the next piece of information together what so. have you got in your brain to rattle rattle <laughs> well, there's not much i went to the doc the other day and he put a he looked through the, and the light showed up on the other side 
<laughs> nothing in there. Huh? <laughs> Doing okay. You just doesn't seem to be any blockage. <laughs> Gorgeous. So the next part of the slide says, why isn't it called an asset protection trust? And I threw that in there because I've done a lot of research on the internet before I found Brilliance, before I found you, Randall and, and, and Tunson. And there's a lot of information about asset protection, but um, it turns out to be kind of um, uh, giving you false information or, or a false sense of protection. Oh, buy this and now you're protected. Whereas right. being with you and studying with you, I now understand um, you call it a private irrevocable trust because we're set up and co-trustees to care for our beneficiaries. We're caring okay. for assets for the benefit of the beneficiaries and that's our focus. Right. It's a personal, it's a private irrevocable trust, private personal irrevocable trust, but it's a private irrevocable trust that you and two other people, or maybe three, have established, signed the paperwork, created a contract between the three of you or the four of you, and then you're off and running. So uh, it's really critical to understand that. And when you get the document, um, you know, it's like I get questions and they haven't even either become a client yet or um, you know, haven't really started and they're already asking these things that, um, that don't make any sense. So in other words, I, I, sometimes I have clients and they said, okay, well, let me ask you something. You've had the trust document for six months and um, have you read it all the way through yet? Have you read every page? Do you understand every page? Well, I don't know. I've been kind of busy, so I really haven't done anything with it. And I say, well, um, you know, before I spend a half an hour explaining this one particular item here, here is the paragraph. I want you to go look, you know, in this section here, it's probably three or four pages long, and just go through it and write questions down, write your questions down then send me an email and um, I'll be happy to respond to it. And if it involves phone chat, I don't mind that either. Just um, I want to have you make sure that you've read what's in front of you before you ask a question. It is, it's too simple to really take time time with because it's there it's like there's so much information in the in the indenture if you get the full indenture it's about 37 to 39 pages depending on uh, you know who you, who's involved etc but there's a lot of information and it's not it's not like reading a law book um, well it is in a way but it's not as intense and it's been simplified so that if you really truly read it, um, then that's fine. If you if you can if you phone me or email me and say that you honestly read this, and on page nineteen I have this question uh, about this particular thing, then I'll be more than happy to expand the boundaries on on that explanation of what you're looking for. I mean, that's what I love to do. It's like Dominique, so we're all relationship people. Tanzan and me and Dominique, it's like, it's about relationship with people that are, it's gonna carry into a long period of time if it's done right. And it just gets better and better and better. Your asset base grows. You can use it, you learn how to use it, you can add to it, you can sub subtract from it. As long as you uh, take care of that asset, sometimes the asset is really static, sometimes it's a moving asset. Dominique and I talked about how, you know, if you put a house in, in a trust, that you, you, 
as trustee, co-trustee, you are responsible to also make sure that that house is taken care of and nobody gets hurt on it because if you have other assets in the trust along with the house and somebody gets hurt on the property, then that whole, your whole asset base is at stake. And that's what this whole separation of um, powers is all about, is that, I mean, it's just, you know, if, never mind the craziness that's on TV, but it's having the executive branch and the congressional branch and then, you know, the president. And so you have to consider it in the same way that you have three very important positions to hold to keep that asset safe that's beautiful and it dovetails right into the next comment um i pulled in the idea about the layering of trust in order to increase protection because when you do have different asset classes like a house and then maybe a large investment portfolio right you, you would want to work with you to create another trust in order to create more asset protection. And I yeah. noticed that um, beneficiaries should be different. And you gave an excellent explanation of why you have to be careful about how you craft multiple trusts. Can, can you say a little more about that? Sure. Um, your basic, the basic principle is you have three people involved. You have the grantor and the co-trustees and then the beneficiaries. And if you want to create multiple trust, you can't use the same three people with the same hats on to maintain any separation because it, it's just too, there's too much um, incestuousness. So you've got to have a fourth person, a fourth hat in there uh, that can alternate so you have uh, one, two, three in the first one, and then you have two, three, four in the second one. And then you can go back to one, three, four. And as long as you alternate those numbers, then you're okay. It's just you don't want to use the same three people to create multiple trust. It gets too confusing and it's too close. It, um, I think it's pretty basically easy to understand how that incestuousness can creep in and that, that takes away from the safety of protecting the assets. So this is why people need to continue to work with you and consult with you once they have their, their first trust and they accumulate a lot of assets and they realize they really need to for asset protection, they need to work on another trust. They need to come back and work with you on that in order to make sure it gets set up properly. Yes, or you. <laughs> <laughs> you, I'm training you to. I'm training you because I'm old, a lot older than you. I'm, you're the one that's going to have to be stepping in here in a few years to uh, cover my tracks, and hopefully between now and then we will have that in place and. I know, I know over the years, just hearing tons and fill in a couple of times when I haven't been available, uh, I can tell that he's, he himself has picked up a significant amount of knowledge about it. And um, there's a couple of books that uh, we, Dominique and I were talking about this morning that are, or it's, it's not like having to own a law library, which is the Thing that I had to do I had to spend a lot of money it's like going to Harvard you know like oh this is a biggie and um, but I learned a lot I learned enough and then but the the learning the really uh, the ability to take that learning and turn it into actuality was just uh, ex having the experience of going out there with her and creating a relationship with a client okay what do you what do you want to do with this what, what's your need what's your goal how do you want to do this how many kids do you think you're going to have you know like 
all of those things come into play and you keep expanding them and that allows that whole genre it's like how tons and how many times have you said you look at the Rockefellers and they, there's 270 trusts at least that's that you can find any name to but there's probably twice as many underneath all of that and well um, they were said to have 7,000 in the early 90s well there you go they're not stupid <laughs> They know how to keep those assets separate. And of course, this, the more assets you have, the more separation you need. And it just gets larger and larger. But it doesn't have to be any more complex. It, it's not about the complexity of it. It's about um, keeping it simple, but keeping, keeping it straight keeping track, keeping a, a, a paper trail, keeping a track, making sure that action, every time something, one of the trustees does something, a manager or, or a trustee, that that person, I mean, it's like keeping his diary. And then there's a record of it. And in the early days, we recommended that you you have a, a real book so that you can't like make a mistake or think that you can pull out this little side deal that you did and you forgot about it you can't just pull it out of the book and so if you keep a, a binder and you keep a track record and you have minutes make every time i mean at least once a year if not once a month is you write up uh, what happened this month? What, what did we do this month? Okay, what, we did this, 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 we list what we did, and then all the trustees sign it, and copies are made, and each trustee has a copy of the complete trust document plus all of those minutes. Those minutes are the flexibility. You have the staticness and the solidity and the strength comes from the initial document. But the flexibility and the ability to enjoy the process comes from the minutes and how you treat the minutes and what you do with them and um, the tale you tell that um, can be taken to court if needed, because that may happen. The trust can be sued and and the trust may want to sue somebody if, if you know, if, if there's somebody something does something that, that damages the property, the trust just it needs to be able to step up and say, you know, you, you need to take responsibility for this or we have to do this. So, I mean, that's the, it's a primary aspect of uh, one of the points of the powers of the trustees is to be able to, be sued, sue and be sued, you'd say. I mean, I, I just love reading through the trust every once in a while, especially uh, now that Dominique and I are playing together on this monthly little stream, we're gonna have some really good fun because we're gonna, we're gonna find these little points that we've been working on that I have and she's gonna bring them out of my brain She's gonna she gonna put a plug in one side and then shine the light in and then it'll reflect <laughs> onto the mirror and come out and we'll have that information available for people that are coming into the program. And we'll get you to download more of your wisdom. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Download. Oh yes, download. <laughs> yes. We can I go to the was, uh, I wish it was that easy to be able to download what I've learned in 35 years, just like you do, you know, you, if you could download, we could all download our brain onto, um, in a floppy some form, <laughs> it's recorded. I mean, it would be tremendous wisdom, uh, available everywhere you go. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> uh, Marissa, um, And she, 
he downloaded. <laughs> Excuse me. That's all right. M Marissa was Randall's partner for very, very, very many years. She downloaded uh, all her wisdom onto canvases. So she oh, was a wow. cleaner. And my, this whole house is just full. How beautiful. All that. All that wisdom and all that compassion. All that meaning and wisdom. You know, she was able to translate it. And I, I mean, I look at the stuff that's uh, hanging on the wall and I go, how, how did that happen? How did, how does somebody create something so dynamic on to a piece of paper that at one point it was a white blank piece of paper? And that's the same with writing, you know, how, how does somebody download, you know, this wisdom that's in their brain that comes from 20, 35, 40 years of, uh, of living and have this creative aspect and they're able to translate it somehow. Um, and maybe that's how I wrote the trust. Maybe uh, I just kept seeing bits and pieces of law books and I said, oh, I know how to put this together. Uh, I was fortunate and at one period people were sending their documents that they didn't feel were strong enough. And so they said, well, what do you, what do you think about this? And I'd, I'd read it and I'd learn and I'd go, oh, this is a different approach, but you know, something's wrong, something's missing out of this. And so I would find a way to plug it, plug the hole, plug the, stick my finger in the hole in the dike so that it wouldn't leak anymore. And then it just kept getting stronger. And, uh, and I think that's what we get when uh, people of talent, you know, are able to translate that process into something where people have this look at it and go wow this is pretty outrageous and it doesn't matter whether it's a painting or a, a sculpting or uh, a trust indenture <laughs> anything i mean i i i built these incredible custom homes for uh 20 years when I was learning this skill as a, as um, you know, with the trust work, and and I, I was something I couldn't wait to go to work to do. It's like I, I go, oh yeah, I got, got this dimension that I have to put together today, and I've got one shot at it, and I'm gonna need some help, and I need to make sure that when this beam goes up into the rafters that it fits the first time. Um, and, and that's a, the gift that you get to do when you, uh, whatever it is that you're doing, whether you're writing or painting or speaking or, you know, sharing wisdom, it's, it's amazing. So that's my take on that, I guess. <laughs> I love oh, I it. I get long-winded sometime, don't I? That's all right. It's beautiful. <laughs> I really appreciate that that your trust indenture has gone, it has uh, evolved and been almost like uh, invoked because of issues that you've had to help people handle or issues you yourself have handled right. throughout your life. So you've put these words together for a real purpose. It solved a particular problem for someone at some point. Yeah, it does. It's I'm really, I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. I'm, I'm really delighted. I, I've read a number of trusts, not as many <laughs> as you have, but of the trusts that I've read so frequently, especially when they're um, produced by someone who's statutory, there's a lot of language in it that's not needed, not necessary, and right. not conducive to trust administration. And yeah. so I, I just really appreciate how clear your trust indenture is and that you're available to answer additional questions. Thank you, Randall. 
you're most welcome and that's why we're going to start working together and you're going to we're going to at some point we're going to walk through the trust ourselves the two of us and i'm going to say okay what do you think about this what do you think about that how could we could we add to this could, do you do you have anything you could want to add to this that would enhance all of this because if the two of us are going to start working as a team then when we that means that the, the trust and venture itself may change and we may change that and it'll change it for the better because now there's two p brains instead of one p brain and uh it'll be fun we'll have a king and a piece instead of just <laughs> one p brain it will be fun and uh one thing we talked about in the last uh study class is the necessity for trustees to stay up on current changes so for example i'm in california so i belong to a couple of blogs where I get information about the statutory changes to how trusts are handling things when when people have passed on and right. i'm always curious about like changes to elder laws how how we care for our senior citizens oh and, yes uh, and all these come into play in regards to how we want to set up our trust administration policies and there may be something that someone uh, legalese that someone writes that's applicable and and works really well that we may decide we want to incorporate and that's that's a beautiful thing about create being being able as a trustee to put in your trust minutes something that will help clarify things for people on down the road because yes. our trust is not just for us we want this beautiful um, the asset protection is not just financial or real property it's also the human capital it's yes. the knowledge and wisdom that we're passing on for future generations so yes. it's really important that we watch what's going on in regards to trust administration because people are handling issues that didn't happen before in the past that are new that we can incorporate into our trust you're right especially when it comes around health issues and okay what's going to happen about when this happens and what are we going to do about when grandma dies how are we going to handle it she hasn't signed any paperwork we don't know where her funds are hidden but we've got to find them because otherwise the government's just going to snag it but if we scoop them up and we have it in a proper place then it'll be safe for the future for the future future generation exactly there's always a future generation and even if uh it's like i don't have any uh a family yes the only thing in my the only thing left of my family is uh, your like adopted, your adopted family, yes. <laughs> my friends now, because everybody else is. My son died. My wife died. Yeah. And it's uh. So now, uh, you know, it's cha it, I've changed it so that it's going to either projects that I know will be well. Uh, you know, really happy to have the ability to support those particular projects and some private projects here on Kauai that I'm supporting and some projects um, around the country that I'm supporting. And so it doesn't matter whether it's your family, you take care of your family first, and then you, any projects that you hold dear, you can make sure that that's all included in the in the process and um, it's amazing how it affects people uh, on the passing of somebody and all of a sudden the trust the directions of the trust are given out and and people go wow somebody just gave us a gift to enhance this project that we're doing and it gets better and better and better 
Oh. And it's, it's so beautiful because you can set things up so that not only do you care for the project, but you keep giving the care for the project long yeah. after you're not here anymore. Their right. trust continues to care for the ongoing concerns that you had that, that were your favorite projects to work on. Yep. I, I know of um, a person here close to us who recently passed away at 101 and um, her trust is set up to care for uh, things that were dear to her heart for another 10 years past her life. So wow. the vehicle of a trust is really important for our families and our communities. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. And that's what we're doing. That's what I do that we do this every month and we keep on in, and so I'm so excited about us working together. I think we're going to come up with some, um, some really good ideas that will enhance the, um, I don't know about necessarily having to change the structure of the document, but certainly how to address uh, the minutes in a more clarified way um, and to have things lined out, how to line it out, how to, how to line out what you want in the future. You, you can't be lazy. You can't just say, oh, I, uh, somebody else will take care of it. Well, yeah, you can do that and somebody else will take care of it, but it won't necessarily be where you, th you thought it was going to go. It's, and that's, that's the, that's the inequity, inequity that happens and that's the what happens is when we bring this trust together, when we bring the whole document together, and we bring all the minutes together, then there's a great strength in how that train keeps moving down the road. It's beautiful. And I don't know if I ever told you this, but I have at least 10 years experience of um, being trained with a lawyer on uh, reviewing uh, risk, doing risk analysis for yeah. construction contracts. Yeah. So <laughs> I've, had, I've had a lot of studying of, of contract law. Contract um, law. Yeah, un under, uh, under um, uh, a, a lawyer. So I really, really enjoy it. And, um, what we're saying is that this trust indenture is written in English so that you, the person who's operating and administrating the trust, they don't have to go study all these law books. Right. They have the excellent um, gems of the best way to care for their assets are contained, the directions are contained in the trust indenture that you've created. I mean, it's only 30 pages long. It's, it's not like... A you know, a thousand pages of law book that you have to go through, you know, just to please this person. You get, Now all you have to do is know that uh, within those 30 pages and with all the knowledge you have already, you're going to be able to carry forth whatever needs to be done. And we're going to need, we're going to need that at some point. And yes. Tanzan and I can always use some new brilliance in our <laughs> we call it brilliance in commerce <laughs> and everyone that's another reason why it's a good idea to read your indenture as randall said because it is only about 30 pages which is the distilled essence of otherwise hundreds of pages of verbose legalese that you would get in other trusts even right. common law trusts a lot of them are too verb you know they're too verbose they're too oh. long they're too many words they they're not necessary they actually weaken it and by making it so concise randall you've made a you've crafted a an instrument which is powerful because it's understandable to anyone with a high school education uh and without the legalese but it's the essence you know the essential information has been condensed into it yep and that's what we need. It needs to be simple. It needs to be really uh, well put together, but it needs to be simple. And then when you have those two together and you have, um, if we, as we continue to do this every month, 
we'll bring up new ideas we'll bring up new concepts we'll we'll maybe take instead of doing uh, multiple topics we'll do one topic for for the week you know one just one topic for that one time and we'll just go in depth and one of the things we could do is i think we did a couple where i ran through the trust indenture but now that i got dominique working with us um she and i will i'll say okay why don't we read pages you know this first section the first 10 first 12 pages is the what i call the trust indenture and if the two of us look at that and then we get on the on the zoom together and we go through this and you say well you know th maybe this could be a little different and uh, i'll say well okay how would you put it you know what do you, what how would you change it how would we how could we how could we change this so that it works better for the guy on the street because that's this is what we're doing we're, we're trying to be able to give it to the common person so that they can um can have their they can they don't doesn't have to go to probate doesn't have to go to the government it stays within the structure that, that, that they want to have for the family or the charity or whatever, wherever it wants to go. The fact is, I mean, I think you and I are gonna have some pretty deep conversations. It's gonna be really fun. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Shall we go to the next slide? How are we doing, Tonson? Yep, there you go. Beautiful. So the slides, uh, Randall says, statutory trust versus pass-through trust agreements. And, and at the top, uh, yeah, what oh, is your- Oh, beg your pardon. I have moved my, my slide. What is jurisdiction? Would you like to start with what is jurisdiction and how it affects our, uh, our private irrevocable trust, Randall? Sure. Um, typically, the jurisdiction is wherever the, the trust is established. Um, so let's say it's um, most of the time for our clients, it's in the U.S. So it's in a U.S. jurisdiction. It doesn't mean that it's statutory. It just means it's under the jurisdiction of U.S. law. And so that um, is not necessarily a detriment. I'm not talking about statutory versus non-statutory, but it's uh, it's under the jurisdiction of U.S. law. If you were in Europe, uh, you'd be under the European concept of the law. And we do have clients in England and um, I have a couple of clients in France, actually, and uh, Mexico has been a little issue, but I do have client. I have a number of clients in Australia, and they've had no problem with it. So, uh, the 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 jurisdiction is wherever really it lies, wherever you're doing your business with those assets. So, if you're primarily in the U.S., it would be U.S. jurisdiction, etc. Um, but it doesn't mean you can't move those assets around, and it doesn't mean you can't have multiple be under multiple jurisdiction because if you have as you know uh you know with the work that you do that sometimes you're in four or five countries around the world and so wherever that particular office is that's the jurisdiction that it has to deal with so if it's in europe it has to be under some european jurisdiction but um, it can always be changed, and that's one of the first things we have. Uh, people say, well, how do I change my address? And I said, well, you just change your address. Like if you were going to move down the street, you change your address. You tell the post office, and there it is. And that's the same with any kind of jurisdiction. Um, Randall, we've been saying that the trust isn't subject to any jurisdiction any anywhere in the world, so you may want to distinguish between the trust itself and the actions of its officers. In other words, the trust itself doesn't derive its 
right to exist from any jurisdiction. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, that's way, it's just a concept that's way out there because the, the, it isn't a, the, jur, the jurisdiction, basically, the basic jurisdiction is that here in the U.S. now, some countries are different, but here in the U.S., you have the unalienable right to contract for anything. And I think most countries, most especially English-speaking countries, have the ability to, you have a right to contract with anyone. Or to, for, I mean, that's how business is done. And I mean, the basic, basically the jurisdiction would be under the Uniform Commercial Code, but just all over the world. It's your basic law of contract. You sign a contract, you put your name on it, your thumbprint on it, you're, that's where it, it belongs. That's the jurisdiction it, that it's going to be under. And that can all change. So it's not based anywhere, but it has to operate in certain jurisdictions just in order to do business. In, in one of our uh, study classes, I did some deeper research on uh, Juris, jurisdiction. So diction is spoken and juris is oath, if I'm not mistaken. So oath taken. Mm -hmm. So the whole history of how this all came about is really fun. And maybe at some point we might like to do a separate uh, seminar on just the whole history of jurisdiction and how the, it's incredible, the history of how trusts came about hundreds of years nope. ago and, and through England and the Knights and uh, saving their castles from being absconded by the Kings. And <laughs> it's really interesting and gives I, you I, a... Yes, you said the right thing because I was, I was one of the thoughts processes that I had while I was waiting for the uh, right time to come on TV. I was thinking, oh, jurisdiction, that's right. That's a that's a whole topic within itself that we could cover. And, um, and I was first studying trust law. I was one of the first things we talked about was jurisdiction. What does it mean? What is, what does that juris, juris mean? And how, how does it apply for protecting your property? And why did it come about? And we, that's, we can have fun with that. Yes. A fun session where we just talk about how this whole concept of trust and jurisdiction um, came about because people were just getting their property was taken by the government whenever they were gone. That's why um, that's a whole subject. Let's leave it. For, <laughs> let's leave it for another hour because it like is it. really fun. It is. Uh, I'd love to go through it again. It's it's fascinating how it all evolved. It is. It is. So so your private irrevocable trust is based on the law that governs the right to contract. So it's not based on a jurisdiction. It's based on our right to contract. Your God-given unalienable right to contract. Beautiful. Pretty clean. I mean, I like it. <laughs> if everybody would, if everybody would stick to that promise to, you know, honor the, uh, uh, what are the two things? Don't harm anybody, and carry out your contract. Be true your to your word. contract. Those yeah. are two things. If you do, if you did that in everything in your life, things would be very different here. Yes. But anyway. But we have those two things to have, and um, it'd be a great topic. It'd be a great hour topic. Excellent. We'll turn on it. So I added in uh, statutory trust versus pass-through trust agreements. Would you like to elaborate? What was the first part? I got the second part, pass-through. Statutory trust versus pass-through trust agreements? Well, I, I'm really 
I'm not an expert on statutory trust law, so it's hard to comment on that. But the pass through, and this is what I think what the um, the books you've been reading are all about, is that's where you the trust doesn't hold any of the assets. It allows those assets to flow to the beneficiaries. And so the trust is never really holding the assets. It can, but it also can go to the beneficiaries. And then it's up to the beneficiaries' responsibility to take care of it. And um, so it's, I don't, it's really hard to explain because I worked with a guy and he just wrote what he called a simple pass through trust. But it, that's all it was. It was like five pages long and it basically says the trust will hold a certain amount of asset and every year it has to give any profit to the beneficiary. And that works in a certain way. That means um, there's no liability to the trust. And, but that means that the person that receives that beneficial interest, then they're responsible for any taxes that are gonna be attached to that pass-through. And one of the ideas with this is, uh, with the trust that we're doing is that it can hold those assets. And it may or may not, uh, um, be liable for taxes. It depends on the situation. And, um, but the idea is it can accumulate. I mean, one of the, in the document itself is that the trust has the ability to accumulate assets and not have to pass them necessarily through to the beneficiaries. And um, that means that I mean, and that's how the Rockefellers did it, even though they did it on a statutory level. Um, they accumulated all of that wealth by having the trust say specifically that this trust is allowed to accumulate assets and keep them for future beneficiaries. And that's part of why we all get to enjoy the Getty Museum. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's it's such a simple concept when you see that uh, people say, hey, I, I know I have so much money, I don't know what to do with it. So how do I deal with it? Well, we're going to set it up in a trust and it's all going to go to foundations and um, in museums, et cetera, et cetera. And I just had a question today from a client and he said, I want to set up a foundation. And I said, well, what? what are you thinking about as a foundation? I said, you know, there are two kinds of foundation and one is a 501c3 and that's what most public uh, foundations were all about, but there's so much paperwork involved. Or you can have a 508 foundation in which there's nothing, there's nothing no paperwork like that, it doesn't, the difference being is uh, on a 501c3 is that people can write off what they give to the foundation. Whereas in a 508, they may not be able to write it off, but they don't care. They're just, they're giving it away anyway. I'd rather have it go to this museum and rather than give it to somebody that really doesn't need to have it. And, um, those are the two minor differences. I mean, there's a lot more, but that's, that's the basis. That's, and so do you want to, do you need a foundation? Yes, you can, uh, a foundation on the end of one of our trusts, and you have the best of both. You have the ability to, to hold the money and the trust, and then you also have the ability to put it into the foundation and that foundation can go out and start to collect valuable things that can go in eventually into the museum. That's beautiful. So I okay. oh, should we get, did you have any more slides or do we wanna go do some uh, answers to these questions? 
Sure. It, it, perhaps we could just finish with one uh, more comment about statutory, and then we could, if it's okay, okay. Jensen, we could jump to, jump to some questions. No, we have uh, a lot more slides, though, still to go through. So We do. How's our yeah, time? Yeah, we, we have a lot more material still, Randall, to go through, <laughs> and a long list of questions accumulating, so we better move along here. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, real quick, on statutory trusts, my understanding is what makes something statutory is if an agreement is drawn up by a licensed person. So that could be a yeah. lawyer, a CPA, a banker, somebody who is licensed creates something and then signs it in their licensed capacity, that that would then make that agreement or that trust statutory. Yep. Um, so therefore the natural law trust, it's not statutory, but if someone had a, chose to have a co-trustee and that co-trustee was a lawyer and the lawyer signed in his statutory capacity, then that would turn that document into statutory. Is that correct? Absolutely. You said it correctly. Beautiful. Then we can, we can either jump into some questions or um, go on with the slides. What would you gentlemen uh, enjoy? I think we ought to go to some questions and, um, See, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to see the slide, so um, I'm, I'm kind of winging it here. And if I knew how many more slides there were, then I might be able to collect my brain a little bit more together, and we could do that. So, do you not time, have your computer screen showing, Randall? Yeah, but I, all I have are the questions on it. Yeah. So uh, right now, this is a perfect spot to take up some questions, if that would work, Tanzan, yeah, because the slide is trust administration, duties of the trustee, and discussion about units of beneficial interest. And I think a number of the questions that have been submitted relate right to this slide. How perfect. Let's go for it. Okay, uh, Dominique, do you want to read them or do you want me to? Sure, I'd be happy to. Okay. And thank you everyone who have submitted questions into the chat window. This makes it really lovely to work with. Uh, let's see, I'm scrolling back just for a second. So one of the first questions, which has to do with the um, units of beneficial interest, does an irrevocable trust have beneficiaries or exchange certificate holders and yes randall's private irrevocable trust that's that's part of the beauty of this document is it has do you want to explain what units of beneficial interests are randall yes it's it's the um, it's the value that you hold as a, a beneficiary um corporations you buy and sell uh, in exchange for money. But with units of beneficial interest, all you do is you hold an interest. The beneficiary holds uh, an interest in the value of the estate, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they can't go out and sell that. You can't um, hypothecate your units of beneficial interest. So it means that um, it's for you and you'll, you'll receive so much per year or per month, depending on the value that's there in the trust, but you can't go and just sell it like a share. So it is recognized as a um, legal, um, as a legal instrument, but the Absolutely. beneficiary does not have the right to go and sell it. No. In fact, it, you'll see in, in the document, we could go over it again, but uh, it says if you don't want this anymore, then you have, it goes back to the trustee and the trustee issues a certificate to a new uh, beneficiary. That's how that would work. So you, you can't just turn it in and expect to get money. Now, at the end of a period of time, the trust can decide, or the beneficiaries of the trust can decide that they would like to finish this. They want to get the value uh, that they feel they deserve, 
and go and do their own thing with it. So in other words, some people just want to bail and do something else, which is fine. But then what that means is they have to go back through the trustees and exchange their certificates uh, for something else. And then the value would be redistributed to the other beneficiaries and they could receive the value of what they held in the initial units that they received. Beautiful. I can see us doing a whole seminar on really understanding how the units of beneficial, how you the trustees exchange assets into the trust and issue the units of beneficial interest and how that's administered and how that um, register is kept. Right. That'd be an awesome seminar. But yeah, and we, if you look at the trust document now, you see that not only there's a schedule C which lists all of the um, beneficiaries, but it also has a certificate for each beneficiary. And uh, so if there's only one beneficiary in the trust, then they have uh, unit one and it's for so much. And depending on how many you have, it goes on and on and on. Um, and it can change, but it's um, it always has to go back through the trust and the trustees before it gets exchanged into something else. Beautiful. And um, if you've ever been a part of a C corporation or an S corporation, you would have a book that holds the shares. So the share, right. shares are the corporate people who, who will have ownership in the corporation. So in the right. trust, you have units of beneficial interest, and those are the people who have 100% interest in the assets of that trust. That's correct. Combined. And the difference in the corporation is that you could literally, you can sell your shares. Whereas a, with a trust, you can't, you have to give it back, has to go back to the trustees and there has to be a different arrangement that's made so that you can move on into other aspects that you want to create. Beautiful. And so in this private irrevocable trust, it is possible that a beneficiary wants to add to the trust assets. So it is possible for the trustees to accept assets from a beneficiary and issue units of beneficial interest. Well, they would, but you then they ha you have to um, uh, go back and go through the ratio of what the value is of this person. If it if it's gone, like say it was a hundred dollars in it, and now this person has put in another hundred dollars, then the value or the ratio of what the units accumulated now are have changed that ratio has changed so it just becomes different and it doesn't mean that you can cash out but um, it does change the value of what you can receive at the end of the period of time because at some point the ben the beneficiaries do have the right to say um, like i said we don't we're tired of this we want to go and do something else and so you have a right to do that as long as everybody agrees very good. And I, I feel like there's a whole conversation about uh, being a beneficiary and understanding units of beneficial interest as a co-trustee that we can take on as a future. I know. Yes. <laughs> a whole book on that. Don't worry. <laughs> I love it. So let's see. Um, I'm going to go on to another question. Is it possible? So this had to do with wearing the hats. Is it possible to be the grantor, the managing trustee with other uh, trustees? Yes. yes. And then do beneficiaries have to be listed at the same time as the grantor and the trustees? So in other words, when you issue the trust, do you have to declare all the beneficiaries at that time? It has to be at least one beneficiary. With 100 units. 
Well, yeah, typically if there's only going to be one beneficiary, they would have that 100 units. But um, uh, I just wrote a trust this morning and this is just one beneficiary. And um, he's the grantor, he has two co-trustees and he's a sole beneficiary and that's fine. Beautiful. And if you want to add more, it just changes the ratio basically. Beautiful. So um, uh, someone asked another question about wearing hats. Can I be a nominee grantor? They're addressing it to me, Dominique. Can I be a nominee grantor and also a nominee co-trustee? So my understanding, Randall, is that there is a legal position for a nominee grantor, but you would not have a nominee co-trustee. You could only have a co-trustee or a successor trustee. Is that correct? Well, <clears throat> if you're going to have a co-trustee, could be um, it could, well. You your service as a co-trustee is a service. It's not you personally. Right. You're you're serving. You're a co-trustee as a service, not necessarily personally. You can do that. I think you did one trust you did, you, uh, you sign in, in person. So it just depends. But um, so typically you don't have nominee uh, co-trustees, co but in a sense, you your service as a co-trustee is exactly what that is it's a nominee uh co-trustee service but uh, you're working on, on a professional level you're not working as an individual whereas a nominee grantor could be uh somebody off the street let's inform the audience what nominee means just means a name only yes correct correct so um, usually, just an FYI, when I work with people as a co-trustee, I explain to them, I'm holding for you uh, the adverse position, so I'm not related to you by blood, sure. marriage, or employment, and I'm here as an advisor. I'll help make sure like the year-end minutes get done, and then other than that, what you want to do with your trust, I'm here to advise, but I really try to encourage people that they need to drive their own vehicle. So yes. they need to learn how to, they want their trust to run and they're the point person for opening a bank account or right. um, making a asset purchase um, or exchanging assets into the trust. But right. I, I'm, I'm available as a co-trustee in the advisor position. <laughs> well, it's um, the ad you need an adverse trustee. That's what you just mentioned. And that, that's somebody, that's why I say you can have either two friends or one friend and one family member because you need somebody, one of those trustees needs to be able to say no. And that's the adverse trustee position is he can say, no, this is not appropriate. So it shouldn't be done. Whereas if you have two family members, then there's, again it's too close so you're right you you your nominee service is under one name and your co-trustee service is under another name and those are both okay because they're different and you're signing in two different capacities beautiful there's another unusual question it asks does nominated grantor pick up potential tax issues. Um, that's kind of interesting. I don't, I can't imagine a way that that would happen in the way that you have your private irrevocable trust set up. Uh, I can't imagine that a, a nominee grantor would be responsible for anything to do with the trust. All they've done is they've given their uh, on uh, legal personal name as a nominee grantor to create this trust. And that's it. Then you're done because two pages, three pages later, uh, you as uh, 
grantor are uh, signing over, you're relinquishing all control of the trust to the trustees. So you're done. So you can, it just depends on what name you want, but basically grantor, unless you are gonna be the beneficiary as well, you as nominee grantor are just, it's a name on a form, you sign your name to create the trust so the trust can um, go forward and then it's up to the trustees and then um, the managers to take it from there. And now I'm even leaving, unless the client wants to be a manager, uh, I leave that open. And all I do is I leave that managerial agreement as a template because I have people that want to maybe create a, a, um, a project. And so they, that uh, manager, uh, executive manager agreement is so that they can appoint this person to be an executive manager for this specific project, but not necessarily general manager for the whole trust. The trustees are the ones that really are the managers of the trust. And a lot of people get kind of freaked out about that. Oh, uh, you know, the trustees are going to take my power away. And I say, no, that's not how it works. So don't worry about it. We'll make sure you're covered. Beautiful. So let's see. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> we have lots more questions. But we also have the thoughts about uh, on the screen. Why do we have to clearly identify all 100 units of the units of beneficial interest? Maybe it would be good to address that real quickly. There needs to be, there's 100 units of beneficial interest in every trust document. And the ratio is depending, depends on how many beneficiaries there are. You can only have a hundred units uh, and you can have as many beneficiary uh, as you want, but it all has to be on a pro rata basis, percentage, whatever it is, whatever you want to call it. But that's just the way the trust law works is that there has to be a hundred units and then it's all uh, broken up into how many beneficiaries there are. So and it's part changes. of- And people kind of freak out, but I say, don't worry, that's gonna change all the time because um, people are gonna die, people are gonna be born, the, the numbers will move around, it'll all change and um, get used to it, you know, and learn how to work with it and to make it a viable, option versus you know just renting your household without any protection for those assets so randall um when you're working with your beneficiaries do you have to tell them about the trust and have them sign off when you make changes or uh, adjust the units of beneficial interest do they have to sign if, off uh, on if uh, if i was a trustee yes i would do that i would say, okay, you're gonna, this is what's happening here. This is what you're gonna get as a beneficial uh, holder. And this is what you can do. This is what you can't do. Um, there's also in the, in the document, there's a spendthrift clause. Uh, if pe if um, young people get too crazy and uh, they, toss all their money away, the trust document states that um, they can't come in and raid the trust for the mistakes that these uh, beneficiaries make. It's up to the beneficiary. They have to sue the beneficiary versus the trust. Another way of asking it would be, could you name a beneficiary anonymously without that beneficiary knowing that he or she or the institution has been named as a beneficiary. Yeah, I, I've heard two or three versions of that, but I think, yes, you can do that. You don't have to tell 
the beneficiary that they that they are. You don't have to tell that person that they are a beneficiary. Right. Very good. But the, I mean, if, I mean, if we're doing this, if we're doing this, setting up this trust for the family, then you want to be talking to your family and explaining, you know, why what's happening, why you're doing this, and what it all means to work together. And, um, and that's why we put the spendthrift clause in there so that none of the beneficiaries can come back and, um, you know, come in and bring, you know, come in and try to break the door down and say, I want my money now. And you just say, Oh, sorry, you just lost all your units of beneficial interest. So don't, you know, don't do that. But that's the idea of if you're going to do that with your family, that you do sit down with your family and you explain to them what this is about. Why are we doing this? Excuse me. Why are we doing this trust? What does it mean? How is it all going to benefit everybody in the end? That's, just, again, that's it's like an education. We're all trying to educate our family and children. I mean, especially today is to bring your family into the understanding of how to operate a family situation. Um, most astute business people will start training their children early. First yes. they sweep the floor and then they take stock and then they learn how to count out of the cash register and learn how not to snap their fingers in the cash register drawer if they try to take some pennies out. <laughs> so it's a, it's, it's a whole, you know, educational process to think about this for your family. It's an excellent learning ground because the many minds come together and we can make smarter business decisions when we're getting ideas from everyone, including our young adults, because yes. many great improvements have happened because of an idea of a teenager. Absolutely. No doubt about it. I agree I totally. It. And when we have, and we have to, if if we've trained our children and given them a proper education, then they will, uh, when they they offer anything into that situation, um, it will be taken in in a very serious way. Um, I grew up in a situation where that didn't occur because nobody really knew how to run a business in my family. And so what I learned was on the outside, it was everything I learned on the street and which wasn't always the best situation, but um, that's how I learned. Uh, and as we, I mean, well, we're going to find times and I think is, at some point, you're going to start to have these hits on your um, on all your reviews, and you're going to find young people in high school have heard about you know BIC and how you know what this is all about, and they're going to say, "Gee, let's look at this," or maybe a teacher in a classroom will say, somehow they've you know, either bought a trust or, you know, they've gotten involved and they take, and they take, and they go into the classroom with a, a Zoom ability and they project the particular episode onto, into the classroom. All of a kid, all of a sudden the kids have got a new understanding of what all of this is about. They've never heard it before. Yes. Trusteeship instead of ownership yes <laughs> or um beautiful um, uh, as a word i used to use not a caretaker but um steward uh, something similar to that you know it's 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 a caretaker a trustee is a caretaker he's taking care of the assets in the trust beautiful 
So can you help people understand why that as a trustee, it's not, the trust is not your alter ego. And um, they suggested yeah. that perhaps people should say the trust instead of my trust. Well, it's been a long haul. And as much as I say, I'm writing a trust for your use, but inevitably everybody thinks it's their trust. And I, <laughs> I say, yeah, it's your trust, but it's not really yours. So just be aware of, uh, you can call it what you want, but it's really not yours. That's Beautiful. important for everyone to understand that no one and nothing owns it. It owns itself. The trustees have legal title to whatever is in the trust. The beneficiaries have beneficial or equitable interest in whatever's in the trust. So that's how you separate it out. Trustees have legal title. Beneficiaries have equitable title. Well, an answer to Jeanette's meaning they have the value. Jeanette's sorry, question yeah. was uh, maybe people should call it the trust and stay away from the word my. But I think you know the reason people use the word my. It's kind of like uh, my friend it doesn't mean you possess that friend. It just means it's related to me. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I do it. I say uh, I'm writing I'm writing your trust today. It's just the slip of the tongue or just the way you speak in a simple language. But, you know, whenever I'm delivering it to them, I'm always emphasizing, you know, this, I'm writing it for you. It's your trust, but it's really not yours. And it's, it's just separate. And it's hard to get people to understand that and be able to differentiate from that. Uh, in just got to define way. the words your and mine as not being possessive. Yeah, we're so used to saying my, my, mine, mine, mine. <laughs> so we'll just <laughs> so, the, that. so the alter ego is um, avoided by having a co-trustee who is adverse, meaning they're not related by blood, marriage, or employment. employment. So that, that's how we. That's how we uh, help prevent the, the uh, possibility of uh, an alter ego situation. Yes. So generally we don't really talk about taxes all that much. Uh, so I'm just gonna uh, express the question and you can um, take it where you can, Randall. When are taxes required for the trust? And if money goes into the trust with a K, uh, let's see, into the trust with a K1, uh, is it required? I think it's, for me, it's a choice. If you're, if you've been involved and in, in the system all along and you haven't had enough education to know that you don't need to volunteer anymore, then I would be cautious to tell anybody whether they should file or not. No, it's not, you're not required. The, the trust is not required, but you will all, in order to get an EIN number, the trust, the IRS is gonna say, you have to file a 1041. And it just depends on whether you've been in the system or not. And, uh, Johnson and I have worked with a number of gentlemen who can extract you right out of the system if you choose to do that. It just, but it's, uh, it's, it's scary for most people to think about the fact that they, they don't have to file a 1040. I mean, that's a big deal for most people, and yet you don't. But, it's voluntary. Um, it helps it. Yeah, and that's what makes you, and that's what gets you in trouble. Is it is voluntary, but if if once you file and you put your name voluntarily on the bottom line, then you you're in. Volunteered. <laughs> Just volunteered, and they're not going to leave you alone. The next year, they're going to 
they're going to say, where's your tax return? Where's your tax return? So uh, that's a discussion that we could talk for weeks on. In fact, um, there was a gentleman I worked with in Marin, his, Mitch Modaleski, goes by Paul, Paul Mitchell. And he's, he's brilliant. And um, he and I did a seminar every, uh, every two weeks in my house in Marin. And we talked exactly about this subject, about why, you, I mean, and we went right through the whole IRS code thing. And we pointed out all the places that made you think that you needed to file, but you, you didn't. And um, he's been very successful. And now we have uh, a gentleman in Texas who's um, got this incredible um, document that just can extract you right out of the system. So we can do the same thing with a trust. There's, there's, it's a choice. You have to be uh, understanding of where that knowledge is, how how you can present it, and how you can stand up straight and tall. Um, but it's uh, it, it's, it's a it, whole it's yeah. a whole process, and it's more complex than just a simple answer. There's a lot of things that go into it. Okay. So if someone, if a client has a very specific question it would be good for them to, to email regarding that. Is that a good thing to say? Yeah, they can email me or you, or they can uh, email Tanzan, and Tanzan can hook them up with these, the gentleman we work with, and we can go from there. So I think it's better to leave it there than to <laughs> try to explain the situation away, because I've read this paper, uh, and, and it just is, it's like everything I taught, every seminar that I did for almost four, five years in Marin is all in this one page document. And I went, where was this five or 10, ten years ago? <laughs> well, I wouldn't have had to do all of this. So, um, well, I answered one question in chat because uh, they had asked, um, is the trust exempt? And I said, no, it's not exempt because that's a statutory word, but it is an exception to the filing requirements. Yes. That's Beautiful. a good way to put it. So, um, so some... but they still have to, still have to know where to go if there's ever a question about that. And fortunately, you know, you have your backup people. I have mine. Dominique, I know you know people that can help back up that thought process. And you, you have to be, you have to have enough strength to stand up and say, I'm sorry, this doesn't belong to me. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a choice and an education. It's not embarked on lightly. Um, <laughs> Well, I think there's one question we uh, overlooked. Um, can you operate more than one business under one trust umbrella? Yes, I would, but it depends on how big you want the business to be and um, how complex it might be. But uh, a lot of times, like I say, okay, we used to do um, work with LLCs, and I'd say, if you set up your LLC as a storefront and the trust is your back office. And so that's a good way to separate out that there's two parts. And, but I don't do that anymore either. So I, I don't know what to say, but the, you have to realize that, um, again, we're getting back to um, it's, it's an education and, and Maybe um, the three of us can compile um, the people that we know can be, we can reach out. We know where to reach out and find these particular people that can help clients that come along with, that are not strong enough necessarily to do it themselves. That's what we have to find as well uh, for that because I'm not worried about the trust 
but to find the people that can help back up um, people that are not knowledgeable enough to do it on their own or to defend themselves, then I think that's a critical thing that would be a, a service that we could figure out how to provide. There's an old asset protection rule that says never put all your eggs in one basket. And uh, I generally tell people, I don't know, somewhere between a hundred thousand dollars and a million dollars, you know, if your asset or your business is worth somewhere in that range and you have another asset also in that range, maybe set up a second trust, you know, have separate trusts for as many different substantial assets. But like Randall yeah. said, if it's really small, then, well, you know, you can have a few and a few assets or a few businesses in one trust. And if they're really small and they don't have much in them, then no big deal. Yeah, for sure. And it also depends on what the business is because uh, with my construction enterprises, I always recommended based on liability, you either liability. want to have, yeah, right. you want to have a C corp or an LLC right. because there's a liability there. So you wouldn't right. want that actually functioning inside of your trust because you would have what other assets you have there in, yes. in jeopardy, but you could be a, a shareholder uh, of a corporation or a member of an LLC. And that would give you that distance. Absolutely. That's, um, I, do, I say, I recommend it the same way. If um, if you have a business already, don't try to take and put the business in the trust. I suggest make the trust a member or a owner, percentage owner of that LLC or corp or whatever, so that they're not they're separate from the liability. That's a good point. Dominique. Um, so there was another question, which we might have to handle at another time, but I remember reading somewhere, this question has to do with what's the difference between a private uh, irrevocable trust and a business trust. And there's a very specific statutory meaning to business trust. Mm -hmm. do, you, do you want to address that? Um, I used to address it all the time, but uh, like they don't, they don't even recognize the Massachusetts Business Trust anymore. And I don't think they would recognize any kind of business trust. All they just, they consider a 10, 1041, you got to file a return and they, they don't separate it out. They just assume that your trust is going to be a taxpayer. And that's where we have to um, step up and find solid people to that can we can just say okay you have this issue here just go see this talk to this person and go from there so you're right but if you have large assets you're definitely going to want to have more than one trust so the the answer is that it's the natural law trust is a private irrevocable business trust if you have a business in it but it doesn't uh go by those words necessarily business trust to fit a statutory definition because it's non-statutory. Well, yes. I wouldn't, I would just say it's a private irrevocable trust. Just leave out the word business. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's not nobody, but it's nobody's business. <laughs> Your business. Um, someone else was asking about what needs to be notarized in the trust and I, as a notary, I can just tell you, uh, for California, a notary is just saying that when you sign a document, you are who you say you are when you sign a document. So right. does anything need to be notarized? No, it's a private document. But when you go to a bank or you're you know, working with um, a, a, even a statutory person like a title company who you know, right. put a piece of property in, they may ask you, to notarize what they call a trust certificate, which is just a very specific trust minute um, sure. that says you are the trustee of this trust. And That's that right. may need to be notarized. But the notary is just uh, swearing for the public that you are who you say you are, that they've looked at your ID and they've identified you. That's all they're doing. So, yep. um, so is there anything that has to be notarized? No. But you do well, kindly include 
um, a trust abstract and a notarization form that helps people if they have uh, addendum A, if they have other unusual things to put in their trust. You don't, um, okay, you don't, I had some clients say, oh, the bank wanted me to notarize. They wanted to see the whole trust document and they wanted to notarize the whole trust document. I said, just go away from that notary as fast as you can. The only thing in the trust that we uh, say that needs to be notarized is addendum schedule A for foreign currency and that's so that there's a date stamp on that addendum on that schedule that says that that foreign currency went into the trust before the exchange that's the reason that we did it that way but you don't have to notarize the whole trust i said if somebody asks you to do that go find just like Go find another bank, go find another notary. Don't suck into making them say, oh, we have to notarize the whole thing. I mean, I went to a bank the other day and they said, I said, my, I have a deceased wife and this is the new um, uh, successor trustee. And they say, well, you have to get a lawyer, a notarized lawyer, uh, permission that you've made a change to the trust. I went, well, there's nothing changed in the trust, but you have to have another trustee. And uh, sh I mean, this, it just went over her head. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> the, somebody told her, uh, uh, probably, possibly a lawyer, possibly in the bank, told her misinformation. And that's frequently what's happening is people are yeah. getting scared into a position instead of asking questions and saying is this logical that is not logical that right. doesn't make any sense so people have to just relax with it ask questions yeah. and stay stay in that fluid sense of this is my private irrevocable trust is my contract i am the driver of this contract as the co-trustee so and have confidence in that yeah be adamant about it and just if it's not working and get up and and go to the other other bank and just say um this is so it's all it is and so, so, um, interestingly if that was the case it would actually have to say that in your trust indenture that your trust could only be changed by a lawyer and that's not the case it doesn't say that in our trust indenture so she's 100 percent incorrect absolutely but you know the i mean the women that we were sitting in front of were maybe 20 something years old and i could just see the blankness in their eyes when we said you know we need this to be done because i've had i have another i just have to go up to the other bank and see my friend and say you know you wrote this we signed this all together and um uh, here's my wife's death certificate and we just need to make sure you know that we now have a new um, successor trustee. Well, just to illustrate the ignorance in the marketplace, um, I was in a department store one day and um, I was at the cashier and the cashier must have been 18 years old, you know, and uh, yeah. she said, uh, cash or charge? And I held up a dollar bill and I said, do you accept Federal Reserve notes? She said, I don't know. I'm going to have to check with my manager. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I would save that one, Townsend. That's a good one. <laughs> okay, next question. I have no intention of having people as a beneficiary, but I want my LLC to be a beneficiary. That's okay, correct? Yes. Yeah. Why not? Why not? I even heard about a woman who left assets to her cat. <laughs> um, why would you make your LLC a beneficiary? Why don't you make what, what's coming first, the LLC or the business? 
That's a good question that they should email you on. <laughs> okay. Sammy, yeah, I can draw it out a little bit. But basically, if your business is basically um, run by the LLC, then I would just have the trust be a member of the LLC, but an LLC could be a beneficiary of a trust. Anybody could be a beneficiary. Depends on how you want to set it up. I, I want to tell you, we are getting excellent, excellent questions. And I so appreciate you answering all these questions, Randall. Can you continue answering more questions? I'll take a few more. All right. If the title company messes up and lists the trust as revocable instead of irrevocable, is it worth it to correct it on the deed? Uh, we're talking about a property deed? Yes. I would think as long as the trust name is correct and the property is properly described, I'm trying to think, it, you'd probably have to see the document in order to actually uh, have a comment. That's kind of a, a tricky one. It depends upon where it's listed uh, on the document as revocable. Uh, well, you could always, You can always just write IR before revocable and um, have it notarized. Something there like that. Either that <laughs> or just make out a new document. I'd say it's a good idea to, to correct it, to prevent any uh, attackers, would-be attackers, you know? I would because uh, the revocable trust doesn't give you the protection that an irrevocable trust would. Yeah. That's, that's a whole issue of... I don't like to do, I mean, you can get a revocable trust off the web for a hundred and a hundred bucks, but what does it do? The only thing it does is uh, eliminate probate. There's no tax benefit. There's no protection. Um, anybody can walk in on a revocable trust and, and create havoc with it. So I would figure out how to change that. How to, how to I, clean I, it up. I, I, I like that. Not have to see that, not have to know who the banker was. I don't know what kind of relationship, whether it's that you have with the banker. And if you don't, then uh, I'd have to see it. So a good general rule of thumb is try to have everything correct. And uh, yes, it is important that it be marked irrevocable trust. Yeah. <laughs> if possible, private irrevocable trust. Um, private is not necessary. But irrevocable should be clear, excuse me, should be clearly stated. Irrevocable trust. This is an irrevocable trust, not a revocable. Beautiful. How about um, do you use the IRS W8 BEN in place of a tax ID number? No, because I've never put in any kind of ID number for anything like that. Like I've never had the occasion to use that. So I wouldn't know how to answer that. Beautiful. At this point, anyway. Well, to elaborate on that, it's called by the IRS a tax ID number, the EIN that we get, but actually it's for banking purposes only. It's just the ID number that the bank requires for banking, that's all. Yes. But a lot of people don't understand that, so it, it's, it goes more than that. I mean, we know that. Yeah. Uh, nah. well, I don't know. I think the whole banking system is going to change once we, once we have this exchange. It is uh, changing. Change, but until that happens, you still have to play by the rules. <laughs> Otherwise, gonna... they, won't, they won't open the account. Yes. I'm going to flip to the slide for a second. Um, I had the question about what is the protector and if the grantor did not set one up, can the trustees set up a protector in the future? Um, I, I wouldn't, why would they need to do that? I mean, if, if the trustees 
the trustees are already under fiduciary responsibility. So the only one, the only person that really needs to, to do a protector would be the settler if it's if he's a beneficiary and he's not involved as trusteeship. Otherwise, the trustees already are under that obligation. So I don't think it's necessary. Yeah, and the protector's job is to hire and fire trustees. So who, why would a trustee appoint someone to fire them? <laughs> well, I can only think of one situation where um, if I knew I was going to be resigning my trustee position and, and giving it over to someone else, uh -huh. and perhaps I didn't know them as a longtime friend or something, I can imagine that I might want to set up oversight of them if I'm really going to resign and not have anything to do with the trust. Sure. So. As, uh, as long as you, as long as the protector is not related to you and or the trustees, then that would, that would work. Very good. And uh, total brains shift. How do we convey trademarks and copyrights into a trust and how does it work to use them once the trust owns them or once the trust holds them? Well, they would, they would use it as you would. If they own the copyright, um, then the trust owns the copyright. So they have, they have it. It's there and all you have to do is get that copyright notarized under the name of the trust. Uh, it's, it's belongs to the trust. So then, uh, so say I put my, uh, copyright, I produce an almanac. I put the copyright in my trust. Yeah. Then when I produce my almanac, I just say copyright. And then I, I would list my trust as the owner of the copyright. Right. And then I would publish my book just yep. like normal. Yeah. Beautiful. I mean, you can, uh, you know, you could just make a stamp that as long as you have uh, a notarized version that the copyright for this book belongs to this trust, then that's all you need. I mean, you, I mean, you don't really need to stamp it because your book is going to have that copyright on its page, its cover page, or somewhere in there anyway, copyright held by ABC Trust. Yes. I like it. Okay. Back to beneficiaries. How do I set up the second level beneficiary and third level beneficiaries with a minute that sets the time frame when these levels kick in. So I think this person is talking about, um, is there a way for you to, um, if you've set up your beneficiary and then say they have children in the future, how, how does that work? Or would we like to handle that in another seminar? I think uh, briefly, uh, you just create a minute Create a minute saying that in in this event I want this to happen, and in this event I want this to happen, and then it's signed by the trustees and filed for future use. And if you feel it's important, it could be notarized. But I mean, this notarization thing, we never did notarization in in the early days. We didn't need to because. It, the trust is a contract between three people who know each other. And if you don't know each other enough to trust the fact that it's that this person that's signing this document is who he, who he is, then he shouldn't be there. So the notary is for basically for official work where you need to have something notarized, mostly to date stamp it. Like I have one notary that I use all the time and she, she I'd walk in the door and she said, Oh, Hey, good afternoon, Randall. What, what do you want me to stamp for you today? And so she knew what I was looking for and she didn't, she didn't ask. Like I would take a couple of pages in from the trust document. I'd say, I need to get this notarized. And she didn't ask for the whole trust document. She just said, okay, give me, let me see the paper. And, there it was, she stamp it, 
and it was done. All you say when you go to the notary and you present what you want notarized, you just say, this is the complete document. This is the document that I want you to notarize. Yes. That's all. I want you to notarize my signature on these two pieces, on this paper or these two pieces of paper or you know, maybe three or four or five pages, whatever's in there. But that's all you need. You, you're, it's all their job is to notarize that you are who you are. Yes. So um, there was another question before I go to the next slide. Uh, asking about, it, could you talk more about someone being harmed on a piece of property? And they said that they were under the impression that a trust cannot be sued. And that's not the case. It clearly says in our, in Randall, in your private irrevocable trust, that the trust can sue and be sued because Correct. it's a legal entity. It's, I'm sorry, it's, it's a what? It's a legal entity. Yes, absolutely. And if it owns the property, then it's responsible for that property, the trustees in particular. I mean, if the trust, if the trustees, uh, breach the trust, then they're responsible personally for the repayment or for the taking care of the damages. But um, if they're not, if there's no breach of trust. It hasn't been the trustee's fault, but it's because of a negligence, negligence on um, the trustees not getting insurance or not taking care of the property then they can be held financially responsible to cover the expenses of that damage. So would you best recommend if the property is just a normal residential property that yes, create a trust to hold it, but it only holds that piece of property. So then the possible liability is limited or yeah. do you recommend people hold property in LLCs and have, the trust be a member of the LLC. It depends on how many properties you have and the value of each one. Again, uh, if it's just one house, all you need to do is have um, the house in the trust and the trustees are responsible to have insurance on the house and to make sure that it's kept up to standard so that the somebody doesn't get hurt. I think I understand what the person is asking is that a typical example of someone who slips on the sidewalk at a personal home will sue the people who live in the house, assuming that they're the owners and in the sue them in their personal capacity. Of course, uh, they can say, well, we don't own it, you know, so they won't owe anything, even if that person wins a judgment. Uh, they can certainly offer voluntarily to compensate if they wish, you know, out of the goodness of their heart, but they can't be forced to pay for a suit, a judgment against their individual name if the house is not in their name, it's in the trust name. Now, if it's a business well, like a, a hotel, that's, yeah? That's correct, but the people, if somebody gets hurt on the property, then they can sue the owner of the property, which would be the trust. If they know that that's the case, yeah. Well, they could easily find out because you're gonna to have to record the ownership of the house in the name of the trust at some point down the line. It has to be recorded at the county recorder. And so it's up to the trustees to make sure that there's insurance um, to cover any kind of liability, like you said, so right. if somebody gets hurt. And in the case of a business, let's say it's a hotel or something, uh, if the hotel is in the name of a corporation, but most of the corporation's assets are held in the background by a trust, then it has limited exposure to judgments like that. I would say the trust does, but um, I would also say that it's up to the trustees to make sure that there's enough coverage, insurance coverage. I mean, Right. No, no hotel is going to be without major insurance coverage. Right. So uh, it's still appropriate for the trustees to make sure that there's insurance coverage 
for any kind of discrepancy that goes on in a hotel and they would be uh, unwise if they thought differently. Very good. So uh, just real quick on the slide, I have the beautiful mantra, trust minutes, save trust. And what are examples of trust minutes? And we could probably do a whole seminar going through trust minutes. Um, but uh, basically, would you like to give like just a, a one or two minute summary of what exactly the trust minute document is? Sure, it says on this date, Randall went to the 7-Eleven store and he bought a six pack of beer and he came home and he put the beer in the refrigerator and there was a mouse in one of the bottles. So then he went back and he could sue 7-Eleven store for having crappy beer. But <laughs> I don't know if that was anything <laughs> worth trying to figure out. I'm losing my. Uh, <laughs> 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 Obviously, I have beer on my brain. <laughs> uh, so, a uh, trust me. Run that question by me again, okay? Sure, it, and I can help too. So, a uh, trust minute basically, you're you're putting down the date when the meeting happened, who attended. So, you'd be yeah. listing the trustees, and it's okay if they attended electronically. That's fine. Yes. And then you're listing what occurred yes and if there's a schedule like schedule a or schedule c that got updated you might yep. attach that and then you're saying um and we present our our signing saying that this uh yep. this is uh I would indeed it. yes and then every every trustee gets a copy uh and then you know one goes in with the main trust book and the other two are held by the second and third copies of the trust uh, held by the other two trustees. So you're right. I mean, it's simple. If um, you go into your trust book, you'll see there's a page. Page one is a sample of mi sample minutes. And it there's only like 10 things that really need to be listed. And so all you're doing is and just making a track record of what took place during that minute, during that transaction. And it, it can be as simple as that, or it can be really complex. You can talk about maybe you uh, had ideas on expanding the business or, or boundaries or whatever you wanted to do, but um, as long as there's like we go way back when we first started, as long as there's a trail, paper trail, or a track record, then you're covered. And just make sure that everything that you did do at that meeting is recorded, and then I think you'll be fine. So I, I like um, using a record book. I actually have a, a journal that I keep. It's you know one yep. of those big legal journals, and I just write notes in there of what's going on. And then for me, um, I, cause I don't have that much activity once a year, I'll type up a minute and then I'll just go look in my book and there's all the different things that I did. So, sure. um, someone said, uh, do I put in my minutes if I gave a gift to my church or my college? Yes. I, I wrote that down in my record book and then yep. in my minute, um, I'll either attach a copy of my record book and I'll say in my minute, see record attached. <laughs> this sure. is what occurred this year. Yeah. Um, or I'll detail it out, depending upon how uh, fastidious I'm being at, at that year, that's how I record it. That's all I do with mine is I'll sit down, like if something happens, I'll sit down and I will actually write out a minute and date it and sign it. And then, uh, then I'll get, I'll make sure that one of my trustees comes by and, and signs the, the minute itself and that's all it has to be done then i make a copy of it and make sure that there's always three copies one for each trust 
trustee, one for me and one for the other two trustees. So um, someone was asking about putting property into the trust. If the property has a lien on it, do you recommend that it get put in a trust or should they try to handle the lien before it goes into the trust? Because the, the lien, lien follows. The lien will follow the, the property. So, I mean, it's up to you if you, you're going to, somebody's going to have to clean up the lien. So it's either the trust or you. So you might as well take care of the lien first. And then when the property goes into the trust, then it's clean. Otherwise, it'll, it'll just tag along and you'll still have to then, you know, if there's any kind of, um, you know, suit going on and they're looking for not only the, um, you know, how the IRS is, they want, they're going to, you know, late fees and finances and charges and, you know, they just keep stacking it on. So just figure out how to clean clean the lien and then then you can put it away and it's safe or safer than it was if there's a lien on it but i wouldn't um you know if you have a major lien on a piece of property then i would uh, not try uh, you you can't escape the lien so why bother and if there's a let's say the house is worth a hundred thousand dollars and the lien is for a hundred and twenty um then it's not worth putting into the trust because you're you're just losing you're just going to lose more that makes sense thank you um uh, this is a very interesting question because i know we're concerned that our trust has a uh, cash flow to it can someone work a regular job on behalf of a trust as uh, in their paychecks are written to the trust? Um, I doubt it. I think that um, one is most, most banks won't take third party checks. So, um, uh, well, Randall, I can address that. Basically, if the uh, employee's boss will agree to it, uh, he would convert his position from an employee to an independent contractor. Yeah. And just say, I'll do the same work for the same pay and put in the same hours. Everything's the same, except right. you'll just pay my trust instead of me. Is that okay? And small businesses yeah. may do it, but big corporations don't usually, aren't, aren't usually willing yeah, they, yeah, if you're, an, especially if you're an employee, the IRS is really, they're really stringent on that. So you got to be really careful. You'd have to have a really, um, a really good company that would be totally willing to hire you as an independent contractor. And you, you'd have to make out the contract and have to be validated and then it probably could go like that. It's getting trickier and trickier right now. If there's a history of you being an employee and then you jump to being an independent contractor, you have to meet a lot of uh, the statutory requirements that yeah. sh show that you're really independent now and not. Yeah, you have to have your own tools. You have yeah. to, you know, all of it. We went through it a while ago and that's why I just stopped being an employee for anybody and we worked it out when we were building houses in Marin we were all independent contractors we all had our own license and so we had to have our own insurance etc and that's the way it worked and I don't I haven't done that for so long I haven't been in that field for so long uh, I would imagine that it's um, you know just like trying to wade yourself through a jungle, it's, it's very difficult. <laughs> it's a little tricky. Um, I included uh, a slide or a question about trust accounting and how it's different from business. 
I think I'm gonna hold that for another seminar because we can do a whole seminar on trust accounting. That's really fun. I think but, we brought too much material today, Dominic. To I cover know it. <laughs> this is wonderful. <laughs> a preview for people. Um, I, mean, do you want I, I tell you, my brain's getting work today. And <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, it's going on. We've we've been going at it for two and a half hours, so we. We probably should wrap it up. I, I think I, we'll see. I'd like to wrap it up. Um, yeah. <laughs> I haven't eaten. I haven't eaten since we talked. So <laughs> it's time to let Randall go. So it's we'll save time. these questions. Please, Mr. Bill, let me go. <laughs> what I'm thinking is I can get a copy of the chat <clears throat> uh, to to you, and um, then maybe we can publish in our newsletter or something the answers. You know. Beautiful, beautiful. I love it. Randall, well, thank that's, you. you know, that's one way to do it is to have to have all those um, questions come in and just, you know, I don't mind working another 80 hours a day. It's no <laughs> <laughs> well, we can save them for next month's seminar. Yeah, well, yeah. Then there'll be a whole new supply of questions next time. <laughs> well, that's okay. I don't mind. But what, um, Dominique, what we'll do, and um, and obviously, Tanz and you can be involved too. But we'll figure out um, a subject that we want that we feel out of all of these questions that are on the page here. We can go kind of skim through it and say. I think these are the pages that are, these are the subjects or the most important questions. And let's pick one or two of those and let's use those as our topics. Right. I love it. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you so much, Randall. Thank you, Tenzin. <laughs> most welcome, Dominique. It's just been a pleasure working with you. It's our first time and thoroughly enjoy it. The same. The same. <laughs> thank you, Tanzan, for offering this whole thing to everybody as well. And thank you, everyone, for attending. And thank you for offering all your excellent questions. Very good. So until next time. Okay, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Enjoy. Aloha from Kauai. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. <laughs>